Hello everyone, I'm Salim Kikeke. Welcome to Focus on Africa, our top stories. As Zimbabwe grapples with the worst economic crisis in a decade, government-supported protesters lay the blame on US and EU sanctions. Celebrations for the Botswana Democratic Party as incumbent President Mokwesi Masisi wins a five-year term in the country's general elections. There are calls for calm in Ethiopia following protests against the government which has left 27 people dead. Also in the program, investigators say last year's Lion Air crash in Indonesia was due to faults with the plane's design as well as pilot error. The Boeing 737 MAX was the same type of aircraft which crashed in Ethiopia five months later, killing all 157 people on board. And in sports, a new chapter begins for the Ghanaian Football Association as it gets a new president. Thank you for joining us on Focus on Africa from BBC World News. The ruling Botswana Democratic Party has won the general election after securing 29 National Assembly seats, which represents 51% of the vote. The country's Chief Justice announced that incumbent President Mokwesi Masisi will lead the party that has been in power since independence in 1966. Our Southern Africa correspond correspondent Nomza Masego reports from Johannesburg. Celebrations continued in Botswana after Mkhwezi Masisi was declared president once again, giving the ruling party which has governed for 53 years another five-year term. After intensive campaigning against fierce competition, Mr Masisi took his party through the toughest elections since independence. Sure, it's the toughest election we've had to fight, but you know, I enjoy a test. I enjoy a challenge. I love campaigning. The ruling party's unity has weakened since former president Ian Khama defected from its ranks, then labelled Mr Masisi a dictator and then announced his support for an opposition coalition instead. Regional observer missions declared the elections peaceful. Now with a new mandate to govern, President Masisi is expected to concentrate on growing Botswana's economy, despite the country's over-reliance on a single commodity, diamonds. It's also anticipated that he'll tackle the country's high unemployment rate and inequality. Nomsa Masego, BBC News. Supporters of the Zimbabwean government uh, have taken to the streets in the capital Harare to protest against years of Western sanctions, which they blame for the country's economic male. President Mnangagwa's opponents say he is only trying to distract from his own failings in handling the crisis. They argue corruption and poor reform are responsible for galloping inflation and severe shortages of basic goods and services. Shingai Nyoka reports from Harare. <laughs> In the searing heat, ruling party supporters marched through the capital streets, their protest carefully orchestrated by the ruling ZANU-PF party as an economic crisis continues. They denounced US and EU sanctions as modern-day slavery and a crime against humanity. The equipment and the drugs in our hospital because of these sanctions. Today we want to, to, to have come out actually so that our voice can be heard. In the early 2000s, Western governments imposed a travel ban and an asset freeze on over 100 ruling ZANU-PF party officials and some state-owned companies. Several banks, manufacturers and mining companies remain blacklisted. The sanctions followed accusations of electoral violence, fraud and general repression by Mugabe's regime. The government says the black mark by the most powerful nations in the world has affected lines of credit to government and ordinary companies. Successive speakers have blamed sanctions for almost all Zimbabwe's economic problems, the business closures, the collapse of the health care system and the high unemployment. But this is a deeply divided nation and not many people agree with this sanctions mantra. They say that it's diversionary and that corruption and mismanagement are the biggest problems in this economic crisis. 
This was a public holiday to allow as many as possible to attend, but many stayed away. The sanctions issue remains deeply contested here. Opposition parties say the government is trying to distract from its ability to introduce necessary reforms. The EU and US insist they are targeting only specific individuals and companies accused of corruption and civil rights abuses, and that genuine political and economic reforms and not marches or protests can remove them. Shingai Nyoka, BBC News, Harare. An official report into a crash involving a Boeing 737 MAX plane has confirmed it was partly the result of design flaws. 189 people were killed when a Lion Air flight crashed off Indonesia last October. Five months later, a second plane of the same make owned by Ethiopian Airlines also crashed killing all 157 people on board. The 737 MAX was grounded globally after that crash and Boeing says it has made changes to the aircraft's design. Here's Theo Leggett. It was an appalling accident. A brand new Boeing 737 MAX jet crashed into the sea off Indonesia just minutes after takeoff. 189 people were killed. Now, a year on, investigators have set out in detail what they believe happened. We found nine items that we consider contribute to these accidents. They describe a catalogue of failures. A faulty part provided inaccurate information to the flight computer. That made a flight control system malfunction, forcing the nose of the plane down when it was meant to be climbing. The pilots didn't communicate properly and didn't have the skills to keep the plane in the air. Among those who died was Mohammed Rafi, pictured here. Today, his father gave his reaction. It's hard to forget the crash, because my son, Rafi, is the only boy I have in the family. His death can't be compensated by any amount of money. This was not the only tragedy involving the 737 MAX. Just months later, a near-identical plane run by Ethiopian Airlines also crashed, killing 157 people. It's thought that similar issues with the flight control system were to blame. Since then, the aircraft's been grounded worldwide. Learning the lessons from both crashes, we need better communication between the airlines and the, the aircraft manufacturers, between the manufacturers and the regulators, internally within the airlines, and the pilots need to know as well. Boeing says it's already redesigned the controls of the 737 MAX to make it safe. It wants to have it in the air again before the end of the year. But today's report shows that bad design was far from the only problem. Theo Leggett, BBC News. A high-profile activist in Ethiopia has called for calm after at least 27 people were killed in violence over the last few days. It began with protests against the Prime Minister and Nobel Peace Prize laureate Abi Ahmed. Jawar Mohammed has been openly critical of his policies. Violence broke out in the capital Addis Ababa on Wednesday after the activist accused the government of trying to remove his security detail, an accusation the country's federal police denies. He has also accused authorities of stalking instability. At least six people have also been killed in the town of Ambo and ethnic and religious violence against both Islamic and Orthodox Christian institutions has been reported in the areas of Dodola, Harar, Balerobe and Adama. Our correspondent Kal Kidan Yilweltal has more from the capital Addis. Protests began two days ago after Jawar Mohammed, an influential political activist, especially among members of the Oromo ethnic group, announced in a series of Facebook posts that there were attempts to remove his bodyguards, exposing him to life-endangering threats. In two days of violent protests in multiple towns across Oromia region, more than 20 people have been killed. Jawar, who was born in Ethiopia but is now a U.S. citizen, runs an influential news site called Oromo Media Network. He has said that the government is trying to invite mob attack against his house and blame it on ethnic strife. Following that, hundreds of young men and women gathered around Jawar's house vowing to defend him but also protesting against the Nobel Peace Prize winning Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed. 
Protests in other areas included the burning of the Prime Minister's newly published book. Earlier this week, Prime Minister Rabi Ahmed warned against what he called media run by foreign passport holders in what many saw was referring to Jawar. Yesterday, Jawar was joined by prominent Oromo politicians calling for calm. Protests in some areas died down following that and roads that were blocked have been reopened. But ethnic tensions remain high between the Oromo ethnic group to which both the activists and the Prime Minister belong and others living in Oromia region. Ethiopia's largest faith group, the Orthodox Church, has also come out and said that its followers have been targeted. Church leaders have held discussions with government officials over security. Prime Minister Rabi Ahmed had been in Sochi attending the Russia-Africa summit. He has not spoken about the violence. Kalkidan Ibeltal, BBC News, Addis Ababa. This is Focus on Africa from BBC World News with me, Selim Kikeke. Still to come, South Africa prepare to face Wales in the uh, semi-finals of the Rugby World Cup on Sunday. Welcome back. I'm Salim Kikeke. In Uganda now, uh, several students were injured last night after military officers raided a hall of residence at Uganda's Makerere University. Students at the university had been demonstrating over the last three days against a 15% tuition fee increase. Diajan reports from Kampala. Last night, soldiers and police officers entered a hall of residence at Makerere University and beat up students who they suspected of being part of an ongoing strike. When we visited the hostel, we found the doors had been broken, windows shattered, and there were several students who had visible injuries. These guys entered, I think there's uh, some small chaos out there. So they entered the hall and they started uh, breaking into doors. They were kicking and uh, some of them had, uh, I don't know what they used to break the locks. 13 others are still admitted at the university hospital. The administration says it did not sanction the raid. Makere being at the center, and with students who are very much energetic and important and they are pursuing for any other issue that they may be wanting, security came on board. And I just want to let you know that for the issue of security, even when you think it's my house, and if they claim that they have to be there, then that supersedes what your authority may be like. That's what I can say. University authorities add that more than 60 students were arrested and are currently in police custody. Police and the army have denied knowledge of the assault. I can only tell you that one day the police station did not conduct any operation in the school. They don't know any operation that happened there. But if there was something that happened and the police officers in the university were not informed or involved, it is something that we ought to look into and investigate. What happened? What happened to these students as uh, the allegation is being put forward? Thursday night's raid comes three days after students at Makere University began a strike against a 15% increment to their tuition fees. In 2018, the university management and student leaders sat down and agreed that a 15% increment would be imposed on all new students for the next five years as part of a new fee structure. Dear Jean, BBC News, Kampala. In the Gambia, two staunch enemies and former members of the defunct government have publicly reconciled on television. The event happened during a hearing at the Truth, Reconciliation and Reparations Commission set up to probe human rights violations during the 22-year rule of ex-president Yahya Jame. Our West Africa correspondent Louise Devast reports. An improbable moment sealed with a prayer. Sana Sabali and Edward Singate reconciling in front of a crowd at the Truth Commission. Both men were part of a bloody coup in 1994 that brought Yaya Jame to power. But a year later, Sabali was arrested and sentenced to nine years in prison, where he says he was tortured. Either way, we are victims, either way, we are oppressors. So I decided to initiate the line so that we can reconcile for our personal interest, so to make a line so that at least we ask for forgiveness deep from our hearts to the nation so that the victims and their families find it in their hearts to give us a forgiveness. 
which will actually help us all to reconcile with our inner knowledge, sorry, in Germany, with our inner minds to be able to move forward as a nation in the reconciliatory form. Singate, who confessed to other crimes, said he had fabricated the charges against his former colleague. We fell apart to such an extent that uh, you had to go through something so terrible. Yes, I, I had assassination attempts and I was poisoned and people shot at me, but that is nothing, nothing compared to what you had to go through. No human being should have had to go through that. The Truth Commission, an initiative of current President Adama Barrow, started in January and is expected to sit for two years. The hearings have generated controversy in the country, with some questioning their purpose. But the head of the commission insists that reconciliation is key, even before judicial proceedings can begin. Louise Doast, BBC News, Dakar. You're watching BBC Focus on Africa. It's now time for some sport, and Mimi Fawaz is here for us. Mimi. Thank you, Salim. First there were six, then three, and now one, a new chapter for football in Ghana as Kurt Okraku has been elected the president of the Ghana Football Association in the past hour. Remember, former F Ghana FA boss Kwesi Niantachi resigned following corruption allegations. The FA has been run by a normalization committee since last year. Many football fans will be hoping that this new dawn in their country's football will bring things back on track for them. Let's move on. It's a bit rainy there, isn't it? But hopefully not this weekend as is the semi-finals of the Rugby World Cup in Japan. On Sunday, South Africa will face Wales in Yokohama. They will do without Chesson Colby, who has been ruled out with an ankle injury. Springboks are seen as favorites, although Wales have won four out of their last five games. But for many South African fans that have traveled the long journey to be there, they'll have faith behind their team and their Captain Sia Colisi. Revelation, absolute revelation. It was an amazingly clever move by uh, our coach, Rassi Erasmus, N because he's on form, he's a wonderful leader, and he represents the whole of South Africa. And that's, that's what makes us, that's why the whole nation is uh, behind it. And you look at the crowds in, 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 in South Africa, you look at the crowds in Japan, the whole spectrum of the radio, uh, of the Rainbow Nation. I have to say he's a great leader. Like what he has done with the team, like his leadership skills, he... I don't know, there's just that sense of comfort when he's on the field. Like you can see it with the, the team, there's so many um, issues that have been coming up. But wow, he's been amazing. I think for me, he's one of the best captains they World Cup that I can speak of. That's, that's who we are we, as South Africans. We've got uh, a lot of different backgrounds. But the moment we get united, then we are a very powerful group. If you look at the languages amongst our team, we've probably got about more than four languages in our team. And you know what? we. As, 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 as team members, as coaches and players, we're more comfortable in any language that the players want to communicate and express themselves. And then you saw also when it comes to the, on the stands, a lot of singing, a lot of vibe. And that is something that it's in us as South Africans, you know. That's how we express ourselves. When we're happy, we sing. When we're sad, we sing. So that's, that's, that's a nice thing about being a South African. And it's always good to see our supporters going all, coming all the way from, uh, from home. And the Libyan Football Federation has reappointed Tunisian Fauzi Benzarti as a national team coach on a six-month renewable contract. Benzarti was previously in charge of Libya from 2007 until 2009. His first task will be to lead Libya in two Africa Cup of Nations qualifiers against his native Tunisia on the 16th of November and Tanzania three days later. Now, what a night for Ivory Coast international Nicolas Pepe as he had in the Europa League on Thursday. Two lovely free kicks helped Arsenal come from behind to beat Vittoria Gamares 3-2 at the Emirates. There was a lot of pressure on Pepe since joining in the summer, but the Gunners boss, Unai Emery, has given him his full backing. Pepe is a very good player and, and uh, we believe in him totally. And uh, also... Uh, that's the way he's doing. Uh, he's sometimes feeling better, sometimes feeling uh, with more difficult on the pitch. It depends on the, the opposition. But uh, he's improving. And tonight, that's uh, two goals. 
is really important for us, the first, the first and second for him. I think it's fantastic, don't you think, now that we're seeing Nicola Pepe doing so well? His teammate, Zaha, said he would do very well. So can we say that Nicola Pepe has arrived in England now? Well, Wilfred Zaha, as I said, his Ivory Coast international teammate said, to give him time and then you'll see him arriving in the league. Possibly we could see a turn now. Well, the two wonderful free kicks last night are a confirmation that Pepe <laughs> is here. Now, he is the founder of a global digital money transfer service operating in six continents. Now, Ismail Ahmed, the chairman of World Remit, has been named the most influential black person in Britain on the 2020 par list. The list covers the most powerful people of African and African Caribbean heritage here in the UK. The BBC's Adina Campbell went to meet him to hear about his journey from Somaliland to becoming the fintech leader. I've always remained positive in the face of challenges. And as, as a migrant, and I think this is what you would hear from a lot of migrants, you know, you face a lot of challenges. So if you take those challenges and, uh, you know, remain passionate about what you want to do, you're more likely to succeed. And you've had your fair share of challenges. You grew up in the 1980s yeah. during the, the Civil War. Yeah in Somaliland, you must have seen and faced some very tough circumstances. I witnessed the death and destruction caused by the war and I got stuck and after a month and a half of arduous journey uh, involving travel to the neighbouring country uh, Djibouti, I arrived in London. When you came over here to the UK, you weren't afraid to get your hands dirty, you picked fruit as a way of funding your education. It was my first summer in the UK and uh, I did a strawberry picking. It was one of the toughest jobs I've ever done. So on my first day when I went back to my hostel, I fell asleep without eating or even taking off my muddy shoes because I was so tired and, and probably I wouldn't have been able to eat anything because everything smelled like strawberries. Like many other migrants, I had multiple jobs in addition to my uh, full-time education. And the idea was to send the money, send money back to uh, family uh, uh, members at the, at the time. And that was when I learned the costs and inconvenience involved in sending money back home. So that was your light bulb moment? Yes, that, that was when I then thought about a better ways of, uh, thinking of better ways of sending money. Uh, and then subsequently I joined the UN, but after the UN that was when I uh, started, uh, uh, put, put together a business plan for World Remit. Why is it important for people all over the world to understand that being part of this mobile money economy is also for them? The digitization of mobile money has been hugely successful. I mean, look at Africa now. Uh, uh, there are 400 million mobile money accounts in Africa. There are more mobile money accounts in Africa than, uh, than bank accounts. So today, you know, migrants can now send money by just tabs on their phone. Just we're talking about countries that suffer uh, uh, hyperinflation where sometimes carrying an equivalent of $100 requires a wheelbarrow. So, and, 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 and in, in before mobile money, many of our recipients were literally saving cash under the, under the mattress. How do you inspire others, particularly young people from African and Caribbean backgrounds, to really think big and to be successful. If you don't stay positive, you're likely to lose. Uh, and work on something you, you know, you're very passionate about. Ishmael Ahmed, thank you very much for speaking to us. Well, that's all from the programme. Goodbye.